His hands could stretch an octave and a fifth on the keyboard, allowing him to write and play works that constitute the last breath of the Romantic era. But for all his compositional grandiosity, he was also a sad and deeply troubled man. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Sergei Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff was born on April 1st, 1873, and was a middle child in a large family whose connections included those to the aristocracy, the military, and to music. In fact, one of Rachmaninoff's grandfathers had once taken lessons from nocturne inventor John Field. These musical leanings served the young Sergei well when his mother realized his proclivity towards playing by ear, and he received regular piano training from the time he was four years old. He had outgrown what his mother could teach him by the time he was seven years old, at which point a St. Petersburg piano teacher and family friend came to live with them for the express purpose of teaching Sergei piano. Unfortunately, the family's wealth was vastly diminishing, and Rachmaninoff would later blame his father for it. They traded their veritable constellation of estates for a small apartment in St. Petersburg, and lessons with the St. Petersburg piano teacher had to end due to the same monetary reasons, but not before she helped set him up at the St. Petersburg Conservatory, which he entered at the tender age of 10. The hard times continued as his father left for Moscow, and two of his three sisters died within three years. His grandmother, on his mother's side, became a very important part of his life, both musically and otherwise. His sister Yelena was the second of the two sisters to die, and it was especially hard for Sergei because she was very close to him, and it was through her that he knew the music of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Grief led to academic laziness, and he started slipping in his studies to the point of failure. Even though he was still a star student purely from a raw musical aptitude perspective, he still failed to pass his exams, and his old piano teacher had to go behind his back to tell his mother, because Sergei had been doctoring his report cards. Sounds like an early version of Russian hacking. St. Petersburg was not the right place for him, not academically speaking. Moscow was. And off he went in 1885. It was in Moscow that Rachmaninoff began to develop his compositional voice, as he had been pretty much strictly a pianist up until that point. Most of his compositions are for solo piano, and ten of them actually were written before his first published opus. For the piano curriculum, composition wasn't discouraged, but it wasn't really explicitly encouraged either. And either way, he really didn't have the kind of privacy or time he would have liked to really commit himself and write really strong pieces. He got his grades up and back on track under much more watchful eyes, and his classmates included such luminaries as the composer-pianist Alexander Scriabin of I Want to In The World fame, and Josef Hoffmann, who was a composer sort of minorly, but mostly just a pianist. Both of them ironically had very small hand spans, but an octave each, while Rachmaninoff well, Rachmaninoff, big hands. We're going to dig into the whys of the physiology a bit later. Later in life, Hoffman played a prank on Rachmaninoff by inviting him over to his house to play his new piano. What Rachmaninoff didn't know was that because of Hoffman's very small hand span, he had this piano especially built, with the keys just a shred thinner than usual. It wasn't enough for Rachmaninoff to notice, and when he went to play his latest stuff, he was aghast that he. Nothing was sounding right, he just couldn't play today, he was very apologetic, and Hoffman was just laughing at him. Rachmaninoff passed his final examinations with honors in the spring of 1891, having written his graduation piece, the one-act opera Aleko, in 17 days. Thereafter, he began the composition of his first published opus, the first of his four numbered piano concerti. A little over a year later, his official graduation came when the conservatory declared him a free artist. Successes came swiftly and surprisingly, and included performances of his first piano trio, as well as Aleko. He continued to stay at the estates of well-to-do friends because Russian publishers did not give out royalties. And even though his body of published works was increasing, he wasn't getting the kind of kickback he probably should have gotten from them. It's during this period that he composed and premiered his famous Prelude in C-sharp minor, dedicated to his old harmony professor, Anton Arensky. This would, in a broader context, eventually become part of a massive cycle of 24 preludes in all the major and minor keys, much like many previous composers had done. But Rachmaninoff came to especially resent this piece, because everyone loved it and he didn't know why. Crowds were known to yell C-sharp at him, 
just to see if he would play it as an encore during one of his performances. With this prelude, Rachmaninoff just added his name to the long list of composers who came to despise, or at the very least, resent some of their most famous pieces. He was a lot more than just Mr. C-sharp minor. Rachmaninoff's star was rising, and he soon got word that Tchaikovsky, his musical idol, was interested in playing one of his pieces on an upcoming concert tour. But before that could materialize, Tchaikovsky died under some mysterious circumstances we're going to get to next week on this channel, and it threw the younger composer into depression, out of which came his second elegiac piano trio. And even though this piece was premiered on the first ever all Rachmaninoff concert, dark personal times were ahead. Money was still an issue, and as with most composer-performers, his main source of income was from the latter. He planned and began a three-month tour with the Italian violinist Teresina Tua, but he didn't even get that far. His lack of concentration was partially because he was dead set on writing and premiering his first symphony, Opus 13, one of the first pieces that contains significant Russian Orthodox elements, something that he got from his grandmother even though he wasn't a particularly regular churchgoer. This one-track mindset backfired hard during the premiere. Alexander Glazunov, a composer and conductor, led the orchestra in what was a thoroughly disastrous performance. Not only was there a good chance that Glazunov, a noted alcohol enthusiast, was drunk during the performance, but he was also not a particularly good time manager even when he was sober, and so he did not dedicate nearly enough rehearsal time to the piece. Rachmaninoff was deeply upset and deeply hurt by the abysmal failure, and it was excoriated in the press by Mighty Handful member and itinerant music critic César Cui, who likened it to a symphony on the plagues of Egypt. One of my favorite lines from this review is the phrase, Morbid harmonic perversions. The only thing that Rachmaninoff could do for about three years on a regular basis was give piano lessons. His willingness to compose seemed to have been sapped entirely by this nightmarish premiere, and it's telling that the piece was never again performed during his lifetime. He saw himself as someone who'd had some kind of musical stroke and lost functionality due to it. His one-year engagement as an assistant conductor helped him out a bit, and he was able to write small pieces here and there, but nothing really major, and certainly nothing for larger ensembles. He blamed Glazunov's poor conductorship, saying that the conductor felt nothing while on the podium. And so this might actually explain his interest in conducting. After all, if you want something done right, might as well do it yourself. But he was still mired in depression, and by the turn of the century, his friends and family were so concerned that they staged an intervention, and he began daily hypnotherapy. This actually really helped, and alongside the support of his friends and family, he was finally able to pull himself up out of this mental illness. He finally broke free of its grasp when he began composing the Second Piano Concerto, premiered in movements at the end of the year and in total the following year. The work was well-liked, and the outpouring of public support helped negate the first symphony fiasco. Another three-year period, his engagement to his cousin, it's weird, ended with their marriage. Now, the church was a little skeptical of this setup, but because his family had strong military ties, they were able to go through with it. Talk about a shotgun wedding, am I right? Am I right? Anybody? Nope? Okay. His day job was now much more focused on conducting, and it's likely that he would have been the conductor for a long period of time at the Bolshoi Theater, had the 1905 Russian Revolution not rocked the country. The Rachmaninovs skipped town, first to Italy and then to Germany, only going back to Russia when the political turmoil had settled. He was now intensely focused on new compositions, and put the final nail in the coffin of his mental illness when his second symphony was premiered to great acclaim. Even though he was very secretive about his composition, and really wasn't willing to admit that he was writing a second symphony until he'd pretty much finished it. All the same, he was still very, very concerned about it, and revised it extensively before it was premiered. In the following years, he went on a tour of North America, performing and conducting in the United States to great acclaim and being offered high-ranking musical post after high-ranking musical post, none of which he accepted because he couldn't stand the idea of being away from Russia for so long. An episode from 1912 shows us how deeply Rachmaninoff took musical and personal integrity, as he resigned from the Russian Musical Society when a lower-ranking official was ousted for Jewish heritage. The stress of overwork led him to take a European vacation, but this wasn't particularly restful either, because both of his daughters got sick. Performances of his pieces, particularly his choral pieces, 
became more popular as they were performed for war relief efforts. He was also known to donate the proceeds of his piano recitals to charities or other worthy causes. After the early death of his good friend Alexander Scriabin, he went on a small tour to raise money for Scriabin's widow, where he played only Scriabin pieces. In fact, the story goes that he was one time asked if he was going to play any of his own pieces, to which he somberly replied, No, only Scriabin tonight. It was the October 1917 revolution that changed Rachmaninoff's life forever, and not for the better. Though he had suffered through periods of poverty, the Rachmaninoffs were still known to be upper class, and the Bolsheviks actually took over his estate. He used any excuse to leave the country, and his first opportunity was a concert tour through the Scandinavian countries, in the dead of winter. So he packed up his family, put them on a sled, and they made it all the way to Denmark in 1918. But even though they were safe and sound in Denmark, they were still pretty much trapped in because World War I was still very much a thing. Composition wasn't going to pay the bills, and he had to find some place to go to keep the family afloat. The most logical thing to do was to move to the United States and begin a career as a composer and performer, but mostly a performer. They officially moved to New York in late 1918. His incredible memory saved him, as he essentially had to learn most of the standard piano repertoire when he was in his middle age, something that would have killed a lesser man. Missing Russia greatly, but knowing that the Russia he knew and loved had died, Rachmaninoff attempted to inculcate his family in as much Russian culture as he could find while living in the middle of New York City. His friendships and acquaintances show a desire to recreate what Russia once was. His new Russian friends included the fiery pianist Vladimir Horowitz, who had grown up loving Rachmaninoff's pieces. Horowitz's flashy style of playing and his incredible technical facility was a match made in heaven when paired with Rachmaninoff Concerto, and the composer loved hearing his pieces in Horowitz's hands. He kept so busy that he was infinitely more performer than composer. In the last 25 years of his life, he averaged one quarter of a piece per year. This was, in his definition, failure. With no time to compose and a grueling schedule which took him around the country playing to audiences who just wanted to hear their favorite C-sharp minor prelude, he was deeply unhappy. Soviet authorities banned his music in 1931, after he first openly criticized the communist regime, until 1939. The exhaustion caught up to him in the 1940s, and in 1942, seeking a much better climate, he moved to California with his family. But the illness wasn't just any illness, it was cancer, melanoma to be exact, and he was never actually told of this diagnosis. He passed away at the age of 70. Unable to be buried in Switzerland in accordance with his wishes, he was instead interred in New York. Fighting over his remains has lasted to the present day, with Russia wishing to exhume his body to be interred in his homeland, while his descendants point to his quarter century of political exile in the United States, where he was actually a citizen actually becoming a citizen a little less than two months before he died. By the time he passed away, the Soviet Union had re-embraced his works, for such were the whims of the Communist Party. Rachmaninoff's compositional style was very grand, and he luxuriated in the sounds of late Romanticism long after the rest of the musical world had moved on. Big tolling bells and liturgical serenity derived from Russian Orthodox music permeates his work, all tempered through masterful writing for the piano idiomatic perhaps only to himself. The large chords which came easily to him are often broken in twain by smaller-handed pianists looking to add some of his more difficult works into their respective repertoires, while chromatic scales, usually pretty straightforward for any regularly sized-handed pianist, were some of the most difficult things that he had to conquer. Epic breadth and a sense of brutality are hallmarks of Rachmaninoff pieces, discernible even to the lay listener while more advanced and more nuanced ears might pick up on his chant influences, specifically his use of the Dies Irae chant, in pieces such as the Second Symphony or his tone poem, The Isle of the Dead. He also wrote a large setting of translated poems of Edgar Allan Poe, so if you thought that Rachmaninoff was a morbid composer, you wouldn't be entirely wrong. He was also well aware that his personal style was not something that the academic world wanted to hear. He compared himself to someone lost in a world grown modern. I cannot acquire the new language, he would lament, and I cannot lose the old. Modernity was something he was organically incapable of comprehending. It makes sense. All that was modern, all that was new, 
All that had suddenly and irrevocably changed during his lifetime had always been for the worse, never for the better. During his time in the United States especially, he defended his work by claiming that music could be both serious and popular, a distinction that's always been a part of the musical discourse, but is something that really drove a wedge in classical music in the 20th century, something that I think has done the entire genre a heck of a lot more harm than good. As such, some contemporary opinion dismissed Rachmaninoff as a holdover from a bygone era, or a derivative, or worst of all, a pop star in the form of a virtuoso pianist. With the passage of time, his work has been reevaluated. It is telling that the first symphony of all pieces is now back in the repertoire. Apparently, when it's actually performed well, it's a good piece. Looking at you, Glazunov. He was a furious practicer, putting in unhealthily long hours to improve his technique, something he started doing when he was in Moscow, when he would wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to practice. I'm not that dedicated, that's why I'm a composer. Thus, in addition to his abnormally large hand span, which we'll get to in just a second, one has to have a profound technical command of every aspect of pianism, otherwise his music goes from extremely difficult to downright unplayable. It's difficult to perform them well and with conviction, which is why the composer lauded the performances of Horowitz so much. Most concert pianists today have a Rachmaninoff concerto or three in their repertoire because it's a moneymaker for itinerant keyboardists but the number of truly great interpretations is slim. In Rachmaninoff's own performance style, which we can hear in contemporary recordings, nothing is ever blurry. Textures are always crystal clear and come to the foreground, and the pedal is never used any more than absolutely necessary. And he didn't just bang things out, either. He had a profound gift for lyricism, found amongst the greatest Russian composers, such as his famous wordless vocalese, which has been endlessly transcribed for pretty much any solo instrument you can name. Applying his deep knowledge and his personal theories of composition to performance, he was able to craft meticulously informed interpretations. Often this involved identifying the place or places in the piece which had maximum dramatic effect, and then organizing the rest of his interpretation around those sections, so it could be as wild and as dramatic as possible within those sections, and then the rest of it wasn't nearly to that level of intensity. His hand size has been a matter of speculation. What exactly he had, or if he had anything, is unclear. Physical evidence of Marfan syndrome, one of the things that has been brought up in relation to Paganini, includes his tall frame and the physical maladies he complained of. However, his list of symptoms doesn't really quite line up with Marfan syndrome exactly. He's missing some of the more profound side effects. And besides, everything he complained of probably had as much to do with the long practice hours he put in as actually having a genetic disorder. And yeah, they point to his height, but his height probably wasn't all that abnormal. People like to cite 6'6", which is actually quite tall, but he was probably between 6'1 and 6'4", depending on who was measuring. He was a tall and physically imposing dude, no doubt about that, but exaggerations of his height might have been common because... Well, I mean, he had such a profound stage presence. and It's a psychological thing. What's more likely, and what fits the symptoms a bit more, is that of an overactive pituitary gland. The symptoms still don't quite add up, but an overactive pituitary is a bit more plausible than the Marfan theory because of the way he died. Melanoma is actually a common side effect. Like any good mystery of music history, perhaps we'll never know exactly what he had, but regardless, he had big hands because of it, and this allowed him to create great and dramatic works. It's uniquely powerful and uniquely gripping music that's been enjoyed for generations and will be enjoyed for generations to come.